Eloise broke my heart. I know that I should have been more insightful and sophisticated about this whole matter. However, at the core, I'm still a farm boy, even after all these years. I am Walter Stillman, a future tax attorney by profession. I know, sad, right? But it's still sad or fresh out of law school and earning a Master of Laws in Taxation. I was able to get my only job working in the bankruptcy department of a mid-sized Manhattan law firm. My position is in the firm's smallest practice area, and it must be said, the least desirable. My living conditions are as modest as my work. Rents in New York City are notoriously high. At that time, apartments in Manhattan were not available to junior employees. In those areas called outer, the prices were almost as high. After much searching, I found a room in an apartment with two other impoverished souls at the end of a subway line in Brooklyn. The area was in general disrepair, and it took forever to get to my office. In short, I have a modest job and a roof over my head. More than this could not be said about the beginning of my career in the great city in the East. However, my luck seemed to change almost from the day I started work. The firm's bankruptcy partner was Eric Erickson, a gray-haired fox in his early 60s. He was one of the deans of the New York Bankruptcy Bar, the go-to guide for complex or new issues. He had little patience for the ignorant or incompetent, but he was a good and willing teacher. Many years later, I am still grateful to Mr. Erickson. He, as these city residents say, did everything for me. He was my mentor and friend and taught me skills that would serve me well in the days to come. Without knowing it then, I found my place in life, and then, by pure chance, I found happiness. But first, I needed to mend my heart. The bankruptcy department was mostly just Mr. Erickson and myself. In those prosperous times, bankruptcy was the least popular practice at the prestigious firm of Portman and Rosencrantz. If we needed help, two part-time lawyers were willing to assist, albeit reluctantly. I graduated in a field of law that can be said to have been written by Lewis Carroll, a jurisdiction where left is right and right is always wrong. All laws belong to Alice on the other side of the looking glass. The only member of my graduating class at Northwestern University School of Law who went as far east as I did was Chuck Thompson. We weren't great friends in law school, but we bonded over our Midwestern experiences in a cold eastern metropolis. Chuck worked, or rather, was a slave for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. He was recently married to Carol, a girl from New York. An invitation to dinner at their Manhattan apartment was only natural. Upon arrival, I was stunned by the presence of a tall, extremely attractive woman. Eloise Schaefer was New York elegant, this is the most obvious way to describe her. She was a sophisticated New Yorker with a casual manner that suggested her striking appearance was to be expected. One could almost believe that the perfection of her form was a fact of nature and not the result of long hours of work and ingenuity. Why exactly she became my dinner partner at my friend's house, I had no idea. This black-haired, green-eyed beauty was no match for me. Indeed, no one could have expected that she would be interested in an ordinary-looking farm boy working as a junior assistant. But apparently, Carol Thompson, in her matchmaker wisdom, thought otherwise. An evening of delightful communication awaited me. Eloise Schaefer was not just a beauty, she had what is called personality. Extroverted and not at all shy, she was an excellent dinner companion. She asked me to take her home to her Brooklyn apartment. I expected to catch a taxi, but she insisted that we take the metro. She stayed close to me during the drive from Chelsea, Manhattan, to Borum Hill, Brooklyn. It was a trip that took a lot of time at night and included some walking. She used this time to get to know me better, asking me questions, the answers to which she listened carefully to. It was a heady, ego-boosting experience. At the door of her apartment, she insisted on rewarding me with a kiss for my efforts to accompany her home. It was a scorching hot kiss, she could melt iron with that kiss. She acknowledged the fact with a knowing smile as she waited patiently for the dumb farm boy to get the message. Um, can I see you again? I asked with some effort. We found a mutually agreeable time for our official first date, and then with a second, less heated kiss, she bid me good night. I flew back to my dingy abode at the far end of Flatbush Avenue, not believing that I could be so lucky. Five weeks and four dates later, I was in a deep valley of despair. The night before, Eloise had informed me that she would not be able to see me over the weekend. 
The reason was her previous commitment to another. With great difficulty, I extracted the name of Rodrigo Ruiz from Eloise. Finding this man was a surprise. He was the state labor commissioner, a very tall, handsome elderly man with whom one would expect intimacy from a woman like Eloise. Apparently, I didn't hide my despair very well because Mr. Erickson called me into his office. So, Walt, what wiped that stupid Midwestern smile from your face, leaving despondency in its place? Eric asked. Sorry, this is personal. I wouldn't want to bother anyone with my problems. There's no point in hiding anything from Eric, I thought, so soon he had the whole story. He leaned back in his chair, folded his hands as if in prayer, and rested his chin on his fingertips. When I was a boy, he began, this city was still ruled by the Irish and Jews. It was interesting to watch them, third and even fourth generation Americans who spoke with an accent or inserted Yiddish phrases into their speech. These were men and women who had graduated from Fordham and Columbia but had mastered the art of being professionals with an ethnic flair. Now they are no longer there. Sometimes I miss the fun they brought to political art. Politicians are now black professionals or Latinos. They lack the same pizzazz, or so it seems to me, and I think they take themselves too seriously. Sorry, Mr. Erickson, I don't understand. My deepest wish is that you never lose your Midwestern innocence, he said, sighing. Walter, your girlfriend's man was born Rodney Kaufman. His father was the heir to the Kaufman department store fortune, and his mother was Puerto Rican Jewish, Louise Ruiz. Rodney is married to Sophie Sloan, a member of the wealthy Sloan family. For political reasons, he took his mother's surname and the Spanish version of his first surname. Rody Boy is a professional Latino and a full-time politician. Your lady apparently will prefer you to him for three good reasons. First of all, the man is 47, your lady is much younger. Secondly, he is married to a good Jewish woman with whom he has three children. This woman is not very jealous, allowing her husband to play on the side, but will categorically object to being replaced, just like her rich and influential family. And thirdly, there is Rody himself and his family. These are progressive times, but I doubt he's looking to insult his wealthy and politically supportive family by dating a Christian girl. But what if she's dating him? I noted. Eric frowned impatiently, as he did when asking stupid questions. How old is this lady? he asked. Twenty-nine. A lady with a neglected biological clock, and you are a suitable twenty-six-year-old lawyer. I think you failed to correctly assess your weight in this matter. The introduction of Rody Boy into the equation was only meant to give you the proper motivation to move forward. For dates at this age with a 29-year-old single woman means things are serious. So either be serious or get lost, concluded Eric Erickson. After talking with my boss, I felt better and, moreover, encouraged. On our next date, I pressed the point and was rewarded with a warm response. If we move on, I need to know that things are serious with you, she said. I can ask the same thing. Are you serious? I answered, once again thinking about how smart Erickson is. She took me to her bed. I wasn't a virgin, although I didn't have much experience. She had much more experience, and she used every bit of it. I barely survived that night. I moved into her apartment for a week. The apartment was large by New York standards, with one of those hallways that seemed to go on forever. A marriage proposal was inevitable. She started dropping hints as soon as I moved into the apartment. When we met, Eloise was 29, working as an associate manager at Sanderson Financial Management, already in the ranks of senior management. And soon after our engagement, she became a vice president. I realized that she was smart and somewhat meticulous, but I was almost shocked by her organizational skills. Preparations for the wedding took barely six weeks. Family-wise, she was the eldest of three children and the only daughter. Her father, also a lawyer, worked in real estate development in Westchester and Putnam counties north of New York. As far as I can tell, he was very interested in politics. That's why they planned a really big wedding so well and quickly. Death reduced my family to just my only sister, Nancy, who now lived with her friend on the West Coast near Portland. She stopped talking to me the day she told me she was a lesbian. Maybe it was because I wasn't delighted, but some kind of chasm appeared that could no longer be closed. 
I invited her to the wedding, but she refused. My own career had settled into a comfortable rut. Now, I was doing less serious things without Eric's help. He didn't hide the fact that he was preparing me, the bankruptcy was stagnant, and Eric made no secret of the fact that I needed to be ready when things picked up because he was preparing to retire. You have everything you need, enough intelligence and a pleasant personality, but you need to learn to work, he said. I studied the code of laws and cases very diligently. Yes, but you need some techniques that have not yet been written down. On the Friday before the wedding, I learned a new move. Eloise and her mother chose Labor Day for their wedding. Something I didn't understand about this early date was that it also meant we had the weekend to prepare, and we could fly off to the Caribbean for the honeymoon. Her parents were giving us Tuesday after the wedding. The suitcases were packed and stood against the wall in the long corridor of our apartment, three for Eloise and one for me. I was a little nervous about the wedding, but I didn't have time to think about it that morning. The week before, my bride-to-be had gone to the family home in Westchester so we could have a little time apart before the wedding. This will make the honeymoon even better and keep my wedding jitters from driving hubby away, she said with a laugh. At 10 o'clock on Friday, the last business day of August, three days before the wedding, I had a hearing in bankruptcy court regarding the formation of the first day resolution. Such a resolution is made at an early stage of the reorganization to establish the rules for the debtor's further work under the protection of the court. In a small case like mine, the hearings are not very formal, usually, only a few lawyers and a judge are present. Basically, this is the bank's lawyer and the debtor's lawyer, like me. Judge Marks usually stuck to the rules. I walked into my office that Friday, ready to grab my case file and head to court, but the clerk told me that the judge's secretary had called to set up a telephone hearing. As soon as I walked in, I immediately became nervous. The judge's clerk connected all parties, and Judge Marks said, So, Amanda, tell me what your problem is with this ruling. Amanda was a bank lawyer. She was smart and knew the law. Her arguments were precise and clearly addressed the weakest points of my request. She was an excellent lawyer but not very pleasant to look at. She was nicknamed Sugar, which made no sense. She was short, less than five feet, and chubby, especially in the lower half, but I always thought she had a pretty face. When Amanda finished, I tried to speak, but the judge interrupted me. The resolution is issued. My secretary will fax it to the parties, he said. When the phone went silent, Amanda just laughed. When I asked her what just happened, she said, Judge Marks received tickets from my firm yesterday for the last days of the Saratoga races. He needs to be north of Albany by 1 p.m. He can't talk to us on the phone today. For the sake of appearances, he ruled against me in a case that doesn't really matter. But wait until next time, and I'll stab you, she said, still laughing. It's not the way I like to win, I complained. Take whatever you can get, she replied and paused. You know, my aunts would say that you are a very good young man for a goyim, she said, still laughing, and ended the conversation. Around this time, Eric came in and told me to take the day off and rest before the wedding. When I left, I couldn't help but ask, who are the goyim? He smiled. It's you and me, not Jews. And what some people said that I was a good young man for a guy, oh. Compliment someone likes you, he said. I headed to the apartment thinking I could head to Westchester early. So, I was supposed to arrive only the next day. The wedding rehearsal is on Saturday evening, but damn, why kill time in the city? I expected to be busy with my own business. It should have taken most of the day and maybe even the evening. We would have written and rewritten every word of the resolution to please everyone involved. But that didn't happen, so why not get a head start? I tried calling first, but Eloise's phone went to voicemail. So, I made a fateful choice. I called her parents' house in Westchester, hoping to talk to someone or at least leave a message. I think it was one of those random circumstances that changed everything. None of the Schaefer family was home. The regular maid, Rosita, took the day off to fit the dress she would wear to her wedding. Her cousin replaced her. The cousin was a woman with limited English, who I never spoke to. She didn't recognize my name. I want to leave a message for Miss Eloise, I said for the third time. She's not here. She's in the city, the cousin said. I know that she lives in the city, but she came home for the wedding. 
This is Walter, I said. I'll come later today, I said. She's in the city, staying at a hotel. Come to the wedding tomorrow, said Rosita's cousin. It took a second, but my curiosity was piqued. In which hotel? I asked. Plaza, came the answer. I'm not a suspicious person, but who wouldn't pause after such a conversation? It was almost noon when I broke down and called the Plaza Hotel. Our reception took place in Westchester County, not at the famous Plaza Hotel in New York City. Something was happening that they didn't tell me about. There was a bachelorette party last week, but perhaps the ladies decided to have another prenuptial celebration. I called the hotel and asked for Eloise Schaefer. No one was registered under this name. Then perhaps it was self-doubt that made me ask, how about Rodrigo Ruiz? No, sorry, answered the young woman. Try Rodney Kaufman. There was a pause, and she said, yes, Mr. and Mrs. Rodney Kaufman are staying with us in the honeymoon suite. Please connect me. It could still be someone else, not such a rare name, I said to myself while the beeps were ringing. When the man answered, I almost hung up, but I had to ask. Eloise Schaefer, please? El, it's for you, I heard him say. Hello, she said. I recognized her voice, but could not speak. Hello? Is anyone alive there? She asked. There's no one there, he answered. Yes, he asked. Hello, this is Walter. You shouldn't come to the wedding. I won't be there, I said, finally finding my voice. As I hung up, I heard her scream my name before the phone went dead. I don't remember the next thing well. I was shocked. I sat in the apartment as if paralyzed. In a sense, I was paralyzed. It seemed as if the strength had left my body. Everything good in my life seemed to disappear. It was all a lie, romance, living together, a fashionable apartment. It was our apartment, but in fact, according to the lease agreement, it belonged to her. My mind was in lockdown mode. I knew that I needed to get up, grab my suitcase from the hallway, and leave. I had nowhere to go, but I needed to get out of the place where I was. Someone opened the apartment door. It was her. I wondered vaguely how she got here so quickly. I looked at my watch and saw that it was already two o'clock. It occurred to me that the judge should be at the races. This fact changed my life. Walter, we need to talk, she said. Have you been there all week? I asked. She stood in the middle of the living room, her eyes avoiding meeting mine. We just said goodbye, she said. So, it didn't end like that, I said. Walter, stop it. You know that I love you. How do I know this? I'll never see him again. We broke up, she said. Why? I was with him for seven years, almost from the day I moved to the city. No, why finish? Because I'm marrying you on Monday, she said. No, you're not going out. Walter, please be reasonable. Everything is arranged. More than 300 guests will come, she said. I didn't answer. There was no point. I stood up and walked past her. Where are you going? We must work things out, she cried. I grabbed my suitcase and went out. She followed me, screaming for me to stop. In the end, she gave up. I wandered aimlessly for quite a long time. I vaguely felt that I was heading towards the bridge. It was getting dark, and I was tired of walking. I crossed Court Street near City Hall, found a small bar. It was full of people on a Friday night, but I found a dark corner and crawled into it. Hello, she said. I looked up and saw Sugar Moskowitz. She had a glass in each hand. She placed one in front of me. I thought you looked like you could use it, she said. Thank you, I stuttered, taking a sip of the very strong drink. It's called a stinger, and as you can see, I'm not a religious girl, she said. Religious? I asked. She smiled. It was a beautiful smile. And she explained, drinking at the singles bar with the goyim on a Friday night. And what should I tell my mother about that suitcase? When she said this, I lowered my eyes, suddenly remembering my suitcase. Oh, I, well, I had to leave after all. This is her apartment, 
I said, taking a sip of the drink, which burned to the very bottom. Sugar Amanda didn't ask me any questions. She told funny stories about herself and about people we mutually knew from bankruptcy court. This is a narrow specialization, and everyone knows each other. She kept my glass full and tried to make me laugh. I think she already knew I was engaged and soon to be married, but she wasn't surprised that I showed up at a Brooklyn bar on the Friday before the wedding with a suitcase. Perhaps she drank a little before my arrival and did not understand the significance of the suitcase and where I was now. About the only thing I remember about that evening was Amanda helping me into the car and saying, not far to go. Later, I dreamed about Eloise. She pinned me to the bed and enjoyed herself much more than usual. I needed to go to the toilet. The need was urgent. But when I got out of bed, I realized that I had no idea where I was. The apartment had changed. For a moment, I was completely disoriented. And then it all came back to me in one sharp and painful memory. I left Eloise in her apartment. And where am I now? My head hurt, and it felt like someone had stuffed it with cotton wool. I remembered almost nothing about the previous evening. I remember going into a small bar on Court Street. One of my friends appeared there for a moment. I couldn't remember who it was, and then I did. Amanda Sugar, what was she doing there? And what was I doing here, naked in an unfamiliar bed? I was in a small room. It was barely big enough for a double bed. There was no other furniture in the room. The bed was directly adjacent to the window, which ran from the middle of the wall to the ceiling. I was alone on this bed, which had signs that a second person had slept on it. There was no closet in the room, and my clothes were nowhere to be seen. In fact, the room could have been an oversized closet containing a bed, but there was a door. It didn't open all the way because it was blocked by the bed. I looked out, and there was a larger room. There was a window on one side of the wall, and the sidewalk was visible outside the window. I was in what, in this part of the world, is called an English cellar. This is the floor located below the main building. It is half above and half underground. The windows started just below sidewalk level. This space had been converted into a small apartment, or as I later learned, two apartments, the one I was in and an even smaller back apartment. The main room was divided by a counter into a dining room and kitchen. The bay window was a sort of living room with two small chairs and a window seat. Seeing no one, I crawled outside in search of the bathroom and my clothes. There was a door at the far side of the room. When I got out, Amanda came out in a robe, drying her wet hair with a towel. Oh, you're awake, she said, noticing me just in time. It must be almost noon. My hands flew to cover my groin, which only caused me to giggle. It's too late for modesty, she said. Last night I saw everything. All I could do was run past her, figuring the room she came out of with wet hair was the bathroom. I was right, and after closing the door, I lifted the toilet seat and released the contents of my bladder into the toilet. It was a small bathroom with only a shower stall, no bathtub. I decided to take advantage of this and wash myself before discussing with the hostess what happened to my clothes and suitcase. The shower may have been small, but the water was hot and soothing to my very hungover body. Refreshed, I searched in vain for a towel. Wet and naked, I had no choice but to go out and meet Amanda. I opened the bathroom door and walked out, only to realize that we were no longer alone. A young dark-haired woman sat at the table and looked straight at me with a wide grin on her face. Amanda was in the small open-plan kitchen, fiddling with cups and a coffee pot. How do you feel about coffee? Amanda asked, as easily as if I wasn't standing there naked. I jumped back behind the bathroom door and called, Can I have some clothes, please? Or at least a towel? Both women burst out laughing, but Amanda stopped to say, The towels are in the closet, as are your suitcase and the clothes you tore off last night. Poking my head out from behind the door, I asked, where could the closet be? Still giggling, Amanda pointed the coffee pot at the bar doors at the back of the room, behind the desk and right in front of what must have been the front door to the apartment. I would bring them to you, but as you can see, I'm busy, said Amanda. The other woman made no attempt to get up, and I had no choice but to run to the closet. Having reached the closet, I opened the doors. My clothes were there inside. The suit and shirt were neatly hung, and the underwear lay on the suitcase. 
I grabbed the last one, pulling on my shorts and shirt as quickly as I could. But all this time, I heard the women giggling behind me. By the way, this is my sister Sonia, said Amanda. Hello, Mr. Stillman, said Sonia. Hello, I replied, opening my suitcase to take out my jeans. Because of me, you don't have to get dressed, said Sonia. I am the younger sister, but I'm already married, and I have three children, two boys and a girl. Naked male bodies don't shock me. They both laughed as I pulled on my jeans. Let's go have some coffee, Amanda invited, and I'll bring Bailey in a minute. In case you're wondering, Sonia whispered to her sister, you didn't tell me that he was so shy. I didn't know, Amanda answered, also in a loud whisper. We seem to barely know each other. You're a free woman, Amanda added with a giggle. After putting on my trousers and shirt, I turned to take a seat at the small table. I need coffee. I like it black without sugar, I said. Sonia giggled and whispered to her sister, I think he got his sugar last night. They burst out laughing. I had a headache. Amanda handed me a cup of very strong coffee. As I was putting the cup in front of me, my mobile phone rang. It was Sonia's phone, and she took it out of a large leather bag lying at her feet on the floor. Oh hi, Sonia said, answering. She closed the receiver and whispered, Aunt Hester. Then, addressing her sister, she continued, Of course I remembered. Now I'm with Amanda, but she has guests and I didn't have a chance to mention it. There was a pause, then Sonia said with a grin, No, her company is a man. Amanda ran her hand across her throat as if cutting it off, but Sonia calmly continued, Yes, he is handsome but a little shy. No, he's definitely not a Jew. Yes, I'm absolutely sure. Sonia whispered into the phone, I caught a glimpse of him when he came out of the shower. Now Sonia was laughing uncontrollably. She wants to talk to you, Sonia said, handing the phone to Amanda. Hello aunt, Amanda said into Sonia's phone. No, I will never forget daddy's birthday tomorrow at 6, and at 7 we have dinner, got it? Oh, he's just a friend. Is it true? There was a pause while Hester apparently spoke. It won't work. He's a friend from work. I'm sure he'll feel awkward at a family party. Amanda handed the phone back to her sister and listened while her aunt spoke. I don't know, Sonia said, and then turned to me. She wants to know your name. What should I tell her? Walter, I answered. Walter Stillman. And I'm pretty sure they slept together last night, Sonia blurted out. Amanda screamed, Aunt Sophie is on the line now, saying they want to meet him. No, oh sweetie no, Amanda screamed. Then Sonia handed the phone to me, saying, My Aunt Sophie wants to talk to you. I took the phone and put it to my ear. Hello, Walter. I'm Amanda's Aunt Sophie, and my sister Hester and I are throwing a party in honor of the birthday of our brother Leonard, Amanda, and Sonia's father. We'd like you to come with our Mandy. Could you do this? It will mean a lot to the family. I don't know. I wouldn't like to interfere, I said, looking for a polite way to refuse. I'll leave it up to Amanda. I then handed the phone to Amanda. She argued with the ants for a good ten minutes while Sonia grinned mischievously. The aunties on the phone hung up, each taking turns arguing with her niece. Finally, Amanda gave in. Okay, I'll bring him, she said, and then hung up. Sugar, 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 she does that, you know, said Sonia. What? I asked replaces the word sugar with obscenities, as if we don't know what she's really saying, Sonia explained, smiling. One last time, Sonia stood up and said, well, it looks like my work here is done. It's time to go unload my husband before my kids drive him crazy. Left alone, Amanda turned to me and said, look, you don't have to go. My family can be a little overbearing sometimes. I just don't understand why your aunts want to see a stranger at a family gathering. Amanda gave a short, almost sad laugh and said, Sonia is my younger sister, almost four years younger. On my last birthday, I turned 30, she already has three children. My aunts and my entire family think that I should already be married and pregnant. It looks like your biological clock is ticking on their shelf, but they still don't know me, and apparently, I'm of the wrong religion. But you are the right gender, 
she said and paused before continuing. You see, I used to have a roommate here who helped pay rent, dollar three, five hundred a month. As you probably know, junior bankruptcy specialists don't get paid that much. I nodded, aware of the limited salaries and are part of the legal business. But then it dawned on me. There is only one bed. Was your roommate a woman? Yes, but don't rush to conclusions, Amanda said. I'm not going to say that I'm completely straight, but to have sex with a girl, I need to be slightly drunk. For Jessie, my former roommate, drinking was a deciding factor. She wanted a relationship that I couldn't give her. And here I am, almost straight, a Jewish spinster. I thought about what she said as I munched on a bailey, a flat breakfast roll that has a dented center and is usually topped with onion flakes. It looks a little like a bagel, but it's not the same. Finally, I asked the question that had been nagging at me, were we, together last night? Amanda burst into loud laughter and said, yes, we were together, although I didn't really like being called Eloise. Sorry, I said, feeling my face turn red. Hey, don't be prudish. We were both a little drunk, she said. What's up? You were very drunk. I drank my coffee for a long time and tried to figure out how my life had taken such a strange turn. Yesterday morning, I was on the phone pursuing a case against the woman now sitting across from me in a robe, one Amanda affectionately known as Sugar. Yesterday morning, I was excited about my upcoming wedding to Eloise. The next day, I had already lost Eloise and was discussing yesterday's sex with the same Amanda. This is too much, I said. What? Amanda asked. I said, Eloise, and the fact that I'm here with you, I replied. She didn't laugh, but looking back, it was hard. Listen, you had a hard time with Eloise and all that. How about relaxing here today? Amanda suggested. I thought for a moment. I don't think I can stand being alone right now. If you don't mind, I'll stay. She smiled and said, fine, we'll make my heterosexuality worth it. So we did, and returned to bed. Sex with Amanda was different from sex with Eloise. However, Amanda was so enthusiastic about sex that I was amazed. Wow, you sure like this, I said. It's been a long time since the last guy, she muttered. But not girlfriends? I asked out of curiosity. She propped herself up on her elbows and looked at me. I've slept with a lot more women than men. If that's what you're asking. But it's not for sex. I lay next to her and a little further on the bed. In one swift movement, she was on top of me. She looked me in the eyes and said, In my opinion, nothing compares to a man and sex. But in a relationship, I need more than just sex. I need someone I can relate to, and more than that, I need someone I can respect as a person. How do I fit this definition? I asked. You are a very respectful partner in bed. It's obvious that your fiancé has put a lot of effort into improving your skills, she said. I didn't have a good answer to this statement. I resented the implication, but Eloise did give me a lot of training in bedroom skills. However, Amanda continued, you are here in my bed because you are a good person. I've been watching you. You never hurt anyone if you can help it. You are honest and treat women as people, not objects. In short, you are one of the good guys. This is a group that is in short supply right now. Hmm, I answered. This is all very good, but is this really how a novice lawyer looks like? You were following me, I accused. Followed you? Well, of course, I followed. I saw you on Court Street and followed you to the bar, didn't I? If Miss Eloise Schaefer has lost track of her trophy fiancé, I'm not one to miss the opportunity. I'm not a trophy, I insisted. You're not going to say that she was in love with you, she asked. No, probably not, I said, feeling all the sadness of the situation wash over me. Sorry, she said. I didn't want to offend you with those words. She slid down my body, and we were once again in the grip of passion. In the end, we ordered dinner to go, and after eating, fell into an exhausting sleep. The aunties called in the morning, reminding Amanda about the upcoming party and asking if she could come early to help with the preparations. Mandy, don't forget to take Walter with you, Sonia told us. All about him, 
and everyone really wants to meet him, Aunt Hester told Amanda. I don't know what Sonia told you, but he's not my boyfriend, Amanda clarified. Well, bring him anyway. He knows he's invited. If he comes, he will come, Amanda said and hung up. As far as I understand, they are waiting, I said with a grin. You don't have to go, Amanda said. What else should I do? I don't want to be alone right now, I admitted. Amanda had distracted me from the disaster in my personal life, and I had no desire to sit and dwell on what Eloise had done. Okay, she said, but be aware that you will be subject to scrutiny and treated as a potential suitor. Well, in a sense, I am the groom, but if you don't mind, let's keep my personal problem a secret, I said. Sounds good to me. That Eloise doesn't exist anymore, but just for today, because you're going to have to deal with her, and the sooner, the better, I replied with a slight sigh. Amanda reached across the table to cover mine with hers and said, Walter, you must either go through with this marriage or end it tomorrow. Either way, you'll be in big trouble. I can't get through it, not now, I said. Don't be so hasty. If you give up now, it will have big consequences for your career and life. There will be a huge scandal. Why? I'm not going to divulge the reason, and I'm sure she won't. Oh, my poor innocence, she said, squeezing my hands tightly. Do you really think people didn't know about Commissioner Ruiz and Eloise Schaefer? They have been together for quite a long time. I thought they broke up, I said. Amanda didn't laugh, but her crooked smile said it all. I played Eloise. Dated Ruiz the entire time we were together. But why? I asked. If she wants to remain his mistress, then there is no point in involving me in this matter. He wants to run for governor next year, she said. Your marriage to Eloise seemed to end the affair, and you were a fair catch, the kind of young, decent professional heterosexual man every cis woman in New York is looking for. Cis woman? I asked. A person who identifies with their gender by birth. In this case, a woman. Eloise Schaefer, a young woman in need of a partner to quell rumors of her affair with an older married politician. She played a prank on me, as you New Yorkers like to say. Oh, don't feel sorry for yourself. Perhaps she was just saying goodbye, as she claimed a week before her wedding. Would you rather she did it the week after? Amanda suggested. I would prefer if she didn't do this at all. In fact, I insist on this, I said firmly. Well, you took revenge on her with me. You can still go to Westchester and marry her. It will not happen. Hey, you need to pull yourself together before you do anything rash. If you don't come to church tomorrow, people will ask why. Well, let okay, time out. A scandal does no one any good. You, my friend, are a junior lawyer in the bankruptcy department. Commissioner Ruiz, on the other hand, is a very big shot. You make a wave, and his boat may rock, but yours will sink. Are you saying that I will lose my job? So what? I'm saying you'll lose your career. Nobody will hire you, Amanda warned. I had to pause, but not for long. Amanda, I said, I may just be an unsophisticated guy from Iowa, but when Eloise accepted my proposal, she made a commitment to me. She didn't keep her commitment, and you can't force me to keep mine. Amanda just shook her head. Finally, she said, Come on, you stubborn corn farmer, get dressed. I'm taking you to meet my family. It's not every day that they get to meet a real living Presbyterian. Actually, my family is Lutheran, same crap, she winked. At five o'clock in the evening, we took a yellow taxi to her family's house on Beverly Road. It was prohibited to use car service services. Uncle Morty was a taxi driver, or was until he retired. Morty now lived on his welfare with his two sisters, Hester and Sophie, in the house the sisters had inherited from their parents. Morty was married, but his wife ran off 30 years ago with a shoe salesman, a fact that apparently was never discussed. Aunt Sophie's husband died in Vietnam. Hester never married, only Amanda's father Leonard, the youngest of the siblings, had children. Leonard and his wife Rebecca had two girls, Amanda and Sonia, and now three grandchildren, thanks to Sonia and her husband Gerald Jerry. The house was in an area of Flatbush, Brooklyn, which realtors called Ditmas or Ditmas Park. 
when we arrived at a huge two-story house on a large lot, larger than the standard size for city life, I did not notice any park. Unlike Amanda's apartment, which was across the street from a small park in a quiet neighborhood, her aunts and uncles lived on a busy avenue. The house was built in the queen in style, not big enough to be a mansion, but the single-family home was larger than one would expect in a city like New York. We were greeted at the door by Aunt Hester, a short, strong woman with metallic gray hair. First, she hugged Amanda and greeted her, calling her Mandy. Then she turned to me, examined me for a very long time, and said, Not bad at all, handsome young man. Oh, I think he's very handsome, said Aunt Sophie, appearing from the depths of the house. Sophie was a tall, dark-haired woman. The two sisters seemed like an incompatible pair. Sophie hugged Amanda, and both aunts led us into the kitchen, where the evening dinner was being prepared. There was a large cake on the kitchen table. The kitchen smelled of roast meat simmering in the oven and the sweet scent of vanilla. Will you peel the potatoes, Mandy? Sophie asked, handing her a potato peeler and a colander filled with freshly washed potatoes. I'll take your man to help set the table, Hester said, taking me by the hand and leading me through the swinging door into the wood-paneled dining room. The room was a long, wide rectangle. The parquet floor was covered with a thick burgundy carpet. Dark oak panels stretched from the floor to halfway up the wall, where paper artfully etched with roses drew the eye upward. The ceiling was an intricate lattice work of mahogany and oak. A modest chandelier hung down from a mahogany medallion with ornate carved flowers. Hester led me to the china cabinets along the nearest wall. The closets took up most of the wall on the short side of the room. Numerous sets of porcelain plates filled the cabinet shelves. She led us to the far closet and said, Today we will use these plates. Having said this, she smiled at me and said, It's not easy to be a Jew. All these utensils are needed. At that time, I only had a vague idea that one set of dishes was intended for meat and the other for dairy. Hester handed me a stack of plates, and we began to set the massive table with clawed legs. It was covered with a snow-white linen tablecloth. I couldn't resist and secretly examine the bottoms of the plates and the tags on the linen. Porcelain was brought from England and linen from Ireland. The real thing, I thought, just like people, real. While Hester set the table and I carried the dishes, she seemed to question me aimlessly. I assumed that this was done to separate me from her niece. Soon, she already knew my entire personal history, with the exception of the failed marriage. When we put the last silver fork on the last plate, she said casually, it doesn't hurt, you know, just a small piece. Most children don't even cry. The meaning of these words escaped me. However, before I could ask for an explanation, we heard a noise in the corridor. A powerful female voice called, I'm here, and I brought the birthday boy. It was Rebecca, also known as Judge Levon of the U.S. District Court. As it turned out, she was Amanda's mother. Her father was Leonard, a professor of economics at New York University. I was invited to Leonard's birthday party. Hester pushed me into the kitchen while she went to greet her brother and sister-in-law. When I entered the kitchen, Amanda was peeling potatoes and putting them on the stove. She turned to me and said, We need to wait here while my aunts break the news that you are here as their guest. Am I going to be a problem for you? I asked, suddenly feeling the need to protect her. No but perhaps a little shocking. I've never brought a man home before. Mom can be a little critical, so be prepared. The situation was awkward and only got worse when we were called into the living room to introduce me to her parents. The living room was a large, comfortable room furnished in the style of the first half of the 20th century. This room could feel calm, but I felt tension. On the way, Amanda took a small box from the light jacket she had hung in the hallway when we arrived that day. The box was clearly wrapped as a birthday present. There was an awkward silence when we entered the living room. Father Sugar broke the silence with a smile and a joke. Is this young man my birthday present, Mandy? He asked. No, Dad, Sugar answered quietly. I brought you this. She walked over to give her father the gift she had brought. She didn't let go of my hand, and I realized that she had been holding it tightly for some time. Well, said her father, I was hoping for a son-in-law, but I'm sure I'll like this too. At these words, he smiled at his daughter. Opening the package, 
he took out a baseball that was clearly used. His smile widened as the others looked at him in confusion. Leonard said, thank you, and then picked up the ball. This is a game ball signed by the Mets, he said and stood up to hug his daughter. I heard him whisper in Sugar's ear, still, I would prefer a son-in-law. Sugar whispered something in response, but I didn't hear it. Her father chuckled, but when I looked back, her mother was glaring at me. Just at that moment, Sonia arrived with her husband and three children. The kids rushed into the living room to take their places in the spotlight. Oh, it's good that you came, Sonia said, hugging me briefly, introducing me to her husband, Jerry, a tall, skinny guy who could be blown away by a good wind. Sonia said, this is Sugar's new love, as you can see. At least she got the gender right this time. Jerry shook my hand and said, don't pay attention to Sonia, she just likes to tease her older sister. Soon, the conversation in the living room turned to the topic of the children's latest adventures and the gifts they brought for their grandfather. It was nice to be out of the spotlight, but I felt Amanda's mother's gaze on me. Dinner was simple but nonetheless delicious. The conversations at the table were filled with the hidden joy that these people received from being together. From time to time, I was asked the question. If Amanda could answer it, she immediately began to answer for me. I answered more personal questions simply or brushed them off. Yes, my parents died. The farm is in Iowa. I only have a sister. I ignored all the questions about my sister, partly because I didn't know how to answer them. However, over coffee and birthday cake, everything came out. Judge Levine was watching, and while the children were busy eating the sticky cake, she struck. Tell me, Walter, are you a relative of Stillman? Who will marry Eloise Schaefer tomorrow? I paused before responding but spoke before Amanda, who was sitting across from me, could give the harsh response I had anticipated. Yes and no, I said. It was I who was supposed to marry Eloise, but it all ended. And before you ask, your daughter had nothing to do with the annulment of my marriage. Is it true? Amanda's mother asked, turning to her daughter. Yes, really, if it concerns you, Amanda said, showing her hostility. To tell you the truth, I didn't want to bring Walter here, but he was invited, and he was kind enough to come. I saw that my mother was about to say something else, but Leonard spoke and silenced my wife. Rebecca, be quiet, he said before his wife could answer. Obviously, the young man found out about Mr. Kaufman. I've been watching Walter all evening, and he doesn't seem like a man who could put up with this. It was as if he had splashed cold water on his wife's face. The judge was suddenly speechless. Looking around the table, he realized that while Amanda's parents were aware of the situation, the other diners were not. Amanda chimed in, I've known Walter for some time and admire him from afar. When I found him that evening, lost and alone, I saw my chance to get to know him better. He was hurt by a truly evil woman, and yes, Mom, I love him. He's too good not to be in love with him. While she was saying this, Amanda walked around the table and hugged me from behind. Well done, my niece, Uncle Morty said, ending the conversation on the topic of Amanda and me. I don't remember well what happened after that, except that there was an atmosphere of general satisfaction at the table. As we drove away in the yellow taxi, I turned to Amanda. Are you serious? I asked. What? She asked, trying to avoid answering. I couldn't stand it and demanded. When you said you loved me, were you serious? The taxi seemed to become very quiet, and then she slowly raised her head and said, Yes, I love you. When I first saw you many months ago, I wanted you. But now, it's more than just attraction. I love you, Walter Stillman. Thirty minutes later, I was arrested. Eloise apparently sat in our apartment all Friday evening waiting for my return. Where did she think I could go? However, when I had not returned by the next morning, she became desperate. The wedding was scheduled for Monday, and she suddenly became afraid that I might not come. In a panic, she called the only person who, in her opinion, was losing more than her, Rodrigo Ruiz, a.k.a. Rodney Kaufman. Immediately, they began a search through the police. It took them a day to interview all the bartenders on Court Street to find out that I had left the Shadow Lady Bar in the company of a short brunette. Since Amanda and I had taken a taxi at 12 o'clock to her apartment in Cobble Hill, the police decided to interview all the taxi drivers working in the area that night. 
It wasn't until late Sunday that they determined that the taxi had dropped us off at the corner of Clinton and Congress. They quickly determined that the corner basement apartment belonged to Amanda Moskowitz, a woman matching the description of my companion on Friday night. The police found only a dark and empty apartment, but undaunted, they stationed a couple of patrol cars to await the occupant's return. It was the eager quartet of officers that Amanda and I found upon arrival. They quickly took me away despite Amanda's objections. At midnight, I found myself in a small room that was in dire need of cleaning and a new coat of paint. They sat me down at a table and handcuffed me. No one explained what crime I was accused of. Someone opened the door and Eloise entered. She looked beautiful as always. So, you are responsible for this, I demanded. My tone was harsh and my anger and disappointment were obvious. She looked a little dazed as she stood on the other side of the table. There were two chairs on her side, but she made no attempt to sit down. Walter, please try to understand. When you didn't come home, I became worried that something had happened to you. That's why you arrested me? For what? I asked. You are not under arrest, but under guard until a possible psychiatric examination, said a tall, very handsome man. In fact, he was more impressive than his photographs. He entered quietly, and while he spoke, he moved towards Eloise. He was more than twenty years older than me, and all his efforts could not hide his middle age. I saw that he was making great efforts to check the influence of time. Rodney Kaufman, I believe, I said this with all the venom I could put into my voice. Rodrigo Ruiz, but Walt, you can call me Rod, because I hope we can become friends. For you, Mr. Stillman, and I have no desire to be friends. It's a pity, because I believe that you are in a difficult position and could use my friendship. I raised my arms a few centimeters, causing the chains to tighten on the table. You can keep me here, but not for long, I said with more confidence than I felt. I hope long enough for you to listen to Eloise. She stood there without saying a word, but now she spoke. Walter, you are acting under the wrong impression. Rod and I are just friends. Whatever relationship we had is over. If you had stayed late on Friday, I would have told you everything. We have a saying in Iowa, I may have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. I found you in his hotel room, I objected. Whatever it is the two of you have, a wedding date is set today, and it is in everyone's best interest that you stick to it. Sorry, but I refuse to marry this traitor, I said. Eloise let out a slight cry of pain, but Rod just smiled and said, Language, language, please. Let's maintain composure. Would you rather I call her because that's who she is? I realized that I had slightly hurt Rodney, but he continued to smile. Eloise turned away, crying. Such an attitude will lead to big troubles. You are being very stupid, young man. Eloise is a wonderful woman who will make a great wife. If you don't get married, there will be a terrible scandal. Reporters are expected at this wedding. This is a social event. Eloise's reputation will be ruined, as will mine, because of course, the reason will become known. People love to gossip, and this would be great gossip. I was told that you have a promising career in a prestigious company. If you don't marry Miss Schaefer today, your career will evaporate, and I doubt you'll find work anywhere else, he threatened. Now, now, it's my turn to smile. I wouldn't marry her for the senior partner position, and I certainly wouldn't stay as a junior lawyer in the bankruptcy department. I told you that he would be unreasonable, intervened Eloise, who had her back to me and was clearly crying. Rod just sighed and said, Okay, Mr. Stillman, how much will it cost me to make Eloise Mrs. Stillman? Believe me, you don't have enough money. It doesn't have to be forever, a year or two, and then a quiet divorce. Won't people ask why? I challenged him. He didn't flinch, and something told me that he had more than one iron in this fire. The situation at the time of divorce will be my problem. Name your price for marriage within two years, he said. How long has she been pregnant? I asked, finally realizing. Eloise turned to me. The child could be yours, you know, she hissed. Yes, I said, but I think I'll wait for the DNA test. Rodney just said, how many? No way in the world, I almost spat at him. Further conversation was interrupted by the appearance of a short, fat, 
bald man of about 60. He was followed by two uniformed officers. Upon entering, he said, Hello, Rod, Miss Schaefer, and you must be Walter Stillman, he said, putting his hand on my shoulder. I'm your lawyer, Cy Leibowitz, and this, he said, handing Rodney the paper, is a copy of the writ of habeas corpus that I just filed for registration. You got up quite late, didn't you, Cy, said Rod. Well, you know how it happens, things are going a little slow. Miss Schaefer acted in the best interests of her fiancé. You're forcing us to seek a forced commitment, Rodney threatened. I don't understand how you can do this, since the warrant was issued on behalf of his sister, his only living and closest relative. Woke her up, didn't you, Cy? said Rod. Actually, no. It's still early on the West Coast, Commissioner Rodrigo Ruiz, a.k.a. Rodney Kaufman, shrugged. He was defeated. Cy brought me out, and Amanda was waiting for me. Her mother, a judge, woke up Cy and the judge who signed the order for my release. That was the last time I saw Eloise. The child was never born. I don't know the reason. I know that her biological clock was ticking, and I know that she wanted his child, not me. However, I am sure that if the choice was between a scandal that would harm her lover and an abortion, she would choose the latter. As for his threat to ruin my career, I have no doubt that Commissioner and gubernatorial candidate Rodrigo Ruiz tried everything he could to ruin it, but circumstances intervened. From the 2nd to the 14th of September, 2008, I took leave for my honeymoon, and my destruction never took place. The day I returned to work, September 15th, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, and the financial world was turned upside down. Eric Erickson became the most important partner in the firm, and I became the most important lawyer. It took six months of 90-hour weeks for Amanda and me before we could get married. We had to make it in time since she was pregnant, and it was clearly visible. Amanda didn't think to take any precautions because before that first weekend we spent together, she hadn't slept with a man in quite some time. The eldest was a girl like the next three, however, for turned out to be enough. Amanda became a judge, following in her mother's footsteps, and I have my own firm. When people ask me the secret to my successful career in marriage, I say it all comes from one day as a racetrack judge, one broken heart, and a girl named Sugar.